And so uh, for myself, Jason Castleman, I am the, uh, the chair of this, uh, of this panel and, uh, and also uh, helping to coordinate the, uh, in the discussion. So the speakers this morning, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the speakers as, they're, uh, as they do their presentation. So our first uh, speaker is going to be uh, uh, Marla Breichman from the uh, Manitoba Agriculture. And uh, the topic that uh, she's going to be presenting on is going to be on uh, improving soil productivity. And so Marla is the uh, soil management specialist with uh, Manitoba Agriculture and resource development. So before joining Manitoba Agriculture in 2007, uh, Marla worked as the farm manager for Manitoba Zero Tillage Research Association and also as a soil conservationist with the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration. So the um, floor is yours, Marla, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so a little shorter. So yeah, I, I worked for, oh, I'm dropping all the things now. I worked for a lot of uh, acronyms that no longer exist. Um, and, uh, and then upon joining Manitoba Agriculture, we started off with, well, we were MAFRI, and then we were MAFRD, and then we were Manitoba Agriculture, and then Ag and Resource Development, and now back to Manitoba Agriculture. So I get confused sometimes in terms of who it is that I actually work for, but um, I, what I'm not confused about is the fact that we're here to talk a lot about soil today. And I'm really excited that we had the opening presentations talking a lot about the variability and variable rate. And I think that this ties in really well to uh, what the rest of us are here in this session to talk about, which is really about improving acres. And I want to start with a caveat that when we're talking about improving canola acres, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're always talking about improving yield on every acre, because we have to take variability into account. And we've already talked a lot about variability, but apparently we can't stop talking about it. I know David's gonna talk about variability again too. Um, if you haven't, if you remember nothing about today, remember that soil is highly variable. And the fact that the soil is variable, it's variable for many reasons, um, but a lot of it comes down to there being a topographical, uh, like a, to a topography influence on how water has moved over that soil while it has developed. Um, and what this means is we end up having different soil properties across the entire field. And the fact that, you know, I grew up north of Saskatoon, so, you know, a little bit of topography there, um, but moving to Manitoba, um, in Winnipeg particular, there's not a whole lot of topography there. That being said, every farmer in the Red River Valley knows where their low spots are because they have low spots, um, because when you get an inch of rain, that's where all the water is ponding. And even that slight bit of topography is influencing the development of that, those soils and how those soils kind of look and function. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. And of course, the image that we have here up on the right is about ag capability. So agricultural capability, that class seven rating system, which really is talking about the limitations to, um, to dryland agriculture, essentially, um, those limitations are going to change depending on what area of the field you are, what area within your, the topography is, and then of course those inherent soil properties across the field. These things are good things to keep in mind because this is that kind of base of what is going to be limiting potential productivity across that field. And we need to recognize that treating a field just as one big square might work if your field is extremely flat and doesn't have a lot of topography. Otherwise, we may have to do some kind of different management across the field if you want to improve those acres or improve management on those acres, recognizing that sometimes some of those acres are not meant for, ag uh, for annual crop production. So we need to keep that in mind too. The other aspect of variability is the management that we have placed on that field. So we have things like erosion. Um, this image that's up on the screen, when we ask people, you know, what kind of erosion is this? Quite often people say it's wind erosion, Marla. And I say, no, actually it's tillage erosion. It's the act of moving up and over the field and dragging the topsoil down to the bottom. And so we see these eroded knolls, which isn't coming from wind. It's really coming from, again, the years and years of tillage that have been performed on these fields. 
We have variability, obviously, in soil fertility. We've talked about that already this morning. We have variability in crop rotations. We have variability in residue management. But all of these things, no, they don't just influence the variability kind of from field to field in how we manage the field, but even within the field. Things like soil fertility say we're not variable rating um, or not thinking variably and applying the same amount of fertilizer year after year after year in low-lying areas or areas that are not productive, we're not using that fertilizer appropriately and so it becomes a bit of a waste. So we've actually added to some of the variability by not thinking about the variability when we manage that field. So one of the things I was asked to talk about was kind of just like how do we deal with the variability or how do we improve management on every acre and so of course I'm going to talk about you know building soil soil resilience one of the other things I want to talk about comes back to that idea of tillage and thinking about how we can manage soil kind of from the top we'll come back to that image of the eroded topsoil in a bit um, but when we're dealing with that variability we need to assess areas of the field that have differences and then decide how to take appropriate action on those on those areas so a lot of these things are not new to anybody this is very basic stuff when we talk about building soil and building resilience we talk about you know good crop choice good crop rotation canola snow is not a rotation um, even though some people would like to still think it is, that is not going to be an, like an active rotation. Strategically using perennials and cover crops. Now, I've got lots of opinions and discussion points that we can get to on cover crops, but when I talk about strategic use, it's about thinking about where these things need to be in your field, and if you've got low-lying areas or areas that are not kind of well-producing areas, or just generally areas that need a little bit of TLC, then adding perennials into that system might help. Generally, of course, practices to reduce compaction, because I can talk all day about soil compaction and things like salinity, but you know, David's going to talk about salinity, so you don't have to listen to me drone on about that. Um, conservation, minimum till, zero till, whatever you call it, whatever works for you, thinking about that, again, is going to act, uh, like add into management of variability, but also building resilience in the soil. Um, and then soil landscape restoration, which is what I want to uh, talk a bit more later on. Ultimately, though, again, it becomes about resilience. So we're talking about building soil or building resilience, creating soils that have kind of a bit more of an ability to buffer, really, is what we want. We want things that can buffer change. We want things that can help us mitigate or, like, adapt to change in climate. We need things that can help, help us in that way. And so a lot of these practices are just generally good agronomic practices, good soil management practices, but sometimes it's really hard to put a hard number on it in terms of the value of it and what that value is going to kind of bring back to the grower. Because again, these are long-term practices take a long time to build um, and we don't have a lot of data on giving like an actual ROI on soil building. Um, I can talk a little bit about ROI later on on soil landscape restoration which is a much more specific practice. Um, again this is not new to anyone. Building resilience is going to help us to adapt to all the different things that get thrown at us during a growing season. Um, healthy soils can help to absorb precipitation and hold moisture. Obviously, that is something that we want to see. Um, we can resist surface crusting and erosion. We have lots of problems occasionally in Manitoba um, with surface crusting and soil erosion, and sometimes that erosion looks a little bit kind of different than what we kind of expect that erosion to look like. Um, and of course, you know, healthy soils are going to help to improve overall crop growth. But you know, we can talk all day about how to define that healthy soil. Ultimately, what it comes down to for the farmer is what do you want as a, resi a resilient soil? What are you looking for for health? And then can we work towards trying to build that? So, you know, this is not necessarily something that we see based on landscape variability, although it can be in some areas. Not healthy practice, you know, got compaction problems showing up. Wind erosion is becoming a bigger and worse thing, um, even though the actual act, the amount of soil that's leaving these fields here is very, very minimal. 
Um, but you know, we're, we're looking at an area in Manitoba where we may have seen a lot of no-till in the past, but with the onset of things like soybeans and a lot of vertical till and high-speed shallow disks coming in, we have a lot um, higher risk of these issues coming because we don't have proper residue holding that kind of wind back. Uh, this is an extreme example. This is from the 2011 flood. Um, and so sometimes we get extreme water erosion events. This is not something that um, management by just putting in a perennial or putting in a cover crop is going to fix. So everything is kind of in context of what we can and cannot buffer, but sometimes we get stuck with these types of situations that we're not expecting where we have high, uh, high movement of water. Um, and you guys probably know what that is, and again, I'm going to let David talk about this stuff later on. Um, but yes, salinity is going to be a problem, and this is something that is not going to be as easy a one to manage and might be best taking that out of production rather than trying to waste a bunch of money on that one. So I mentioned health, and the idea of soil health, obviously, we're, we're soil building and thinking about those kinds of practices. We're trying to increase or improve a lot of these different physical, chemical, and biological functions in the soil. Everybody sees these types of Venn diagrams. These are the three different types of functions we talk about when it comes to health. Ultimately, when I am looking at a benefit of all of these working together, I am looking for building organic matter, which has a caveat of not necessarily being able to build forever, but mostly I want to see building soil structure and aggregate stability. That's what I'm looking for in any kind of situation. Because somebody may say, well, but Marla, aggregates or soil structure, that's physical. Let's talk about soil bugs. We want to talk about biology. That's like the hot topic. If you can't give the biology a home to live in, that is appropriate. If the soil is very compacted, if you have all of that, then the bugs aren't going. You can add all the biology you want. You are not going to you know, foster it kind of thriving in your soil if it doesn't have a good home to live in. But aggregates, building soil structure comes from the physical, chemical, and the biological processes working together. And that aggregate stability, the stability of those soil aggregates or little soil chunks and how well they withstand impacts of wind and water and all of that, that comes from a healthy soil with healthy biology as well. So again, these things have to work together. We can't think of one individually. We have to think of all three of these uh, types of processes together. So if we're thinking about building soil structure, it, very simple things. Um, sim I should say simple in words, maybe not always that simple in practice. Um, Soil structure, again, is the idea of how soil texture or soil particles are arranged. I, I teach intro soils um, at U of M, and the students never can figure out the difference between texture and structure. And to me, it's very, very simple. But of course, your texture is the percent sand, silt, and clay um, in your soil. But how those particles are arranged is the structure. And this is going to be dependent on, yes, the texture, but also, again, all the different functions of that soil. But structure is going to allow for water movement. It's going to allow for biological activity. It's going to allow for root growth and allow for proper seedling emergence. And having a better structured soil is setting yourself up for success, but it takes some time to do this. The other thing that we often talk about from an aggregation standpoint or those soil aggregates or the structure of that soil is it is your number one defense against things like erosion, compaction, that sort of thing. So we want to build soil organic matter and therefore build structure kind of along with it. When we have more soil organic matter, we have improved nutrient cycling, but mostly we have resilience built into the soil where we see things like, you know, when that soil is wet, the, the aggregates don't fall apart immediately. And if we don't have good aggregate stability or high number, uh, amount of organic matter in the soil, that soil particle can kind of fall apart once it's wetted, um, and then we get crusting problems and all sorts of other issues. Root channels are a big part of, of uh, soil structure. And so when you're in a no-till system, or let's say a m very minimum uh, tillage system, Root channels or biopores are left behind by past crops that are growing. And this is where lots of people, especially in the US, they talk a lot about cover crops and the benefits of these biopores. 
Um, and so when you look at the, these two sets of images, the one on the left is actually showing canola as a cover crop in this case, um, because this would have been done in Maryland, this work. Um, and so using canola as a cover crop, because it's a taproot, it's left that root channel behind. And then the, later that summer, the soybean is now growing in that same root channel. Roots are lazy. I'm, I'm a soils person, so I'm probably offending a lot of plant people here, but I'm sorry that roots are very lazy and they will take the path of least resistance. And so when they find a place to exploit, they will take that and they will run with it. If you're dealing with compacted soil, then of course, they're not gonna be able to grow through concrete. They will find the crack, they will exploit it. If you're digging around in a compacted soil and you happen to find roots growing on a plain, like a flat area, and they just like grow like crazy, that's a high indication of the fact that they can't grow anywhere else in that soil. So tillage is gonna break things up, which can be a good thing and a bad thing, and David may uh, touch on that in a bit, in terms of you know water infiltration is a good thing into the soil, um, too much water flowing through the soil might be a bad thing in some cases. But again, soil structure, allowing these kind of structures to stay in place, not shearing them off, not breaking them up with tillage can be really helpful. And I mentioned I, I can never do a talk about soil resilience without talking about compaction. And again, I can talk forever about compaction, but when we talk about compaction and we talk about things like limiting our impact on the soil, recognize that the impact that we make goes for a long, long time. This will last a very long time. So this image, this has been around for a long time, um, and may, maybe many of you have seen this image before. So, excuse <clears throat> me, it's on the right, you have heavy equipment that traveled 29 years prior on this soil, and then they did not recompact the soil after. So they managed it with very low impact um, for the 29 years after this one heavy pass happened. Compared to the site that was managed with light, um, uh, like light, light equipment and not compacted it, for those same 29 years. And you can see not just there's less pores, but there's less connectivity of the pores from that impact of the compaction. So again, when we're talking about you know, dealing with all canola acres, dealing with all variability, we can't take away the fact that some of our management needs to consider issues like this, that we do need to, to think about the weight of our equipment and how we're traveling equipment over the field. So generally, Building soil resist resilience comes from the five principles of soil health. You know, keep soil covered, minimize disturbance, maintain diversity, keep living roots in the soil, integrate livestock. I'm not here to talk about all of these, but I just want to throw those out there because again, um, choosing from this list or thinking about ways that you can use ideas from this list is always beneficial for, again, building that resilience in the soil doesn't mean that you always have to take all of these to heart. I think the big thing um, when it comes to maintaining a lot of these practices or bringing these practices forward is thinking about the flexibility of what fits into a grower system. Recognizing that we cannot say, you thou shalt do X, Y, Z. We don't think that way. We have to think more flexible about what fits, what can we do, what can I adopt, what's the easy stuff that I can adopt, and then what can I think about building towards later on. So cover crops is one of these things that comes up a lot. Um, it comes up often around the idea of compaction, the idea that we're going to break up soil compaction by growing cover crops. And when they come out with uh, tillage radish that's you know called jackhammer and things like that, it really makes you think that this is gonna bust through whatever compaction I have. My, my caution with this is that a, it, I mean, it's a tap root. It does have the ability to push a little bit harder through some of these compacted soils, but roots can't be expected to grow through everything. I have seen jackhammer grow like this and that way, um, and those roots divide off and, and they can't make it through plow layers. So we have to recognize that there's limitations to what plants can do based on the fact that we compacted the soil in the first place. So we do need to think about not causing the problem and then just assuming that the crop is gonna fix it for us. We need to think more about not causing the problem in the first place. But when it comes to cover crops, they can be very beneficial if you have a wet fall and you are trying to dry down a soil. That's one time when I'm like, okay, 
I'm good with cover crops for this. It serves a very specific purpose. Um, we have seen them dry down soil. It can actually, in those cases, help you traffic a field at a higher moisture content without causing the same level of compaction because if there's enough of a root system there, it may actually help carry some of the weight of the equipment. So that's great. Caution, always beware the brassicas. You can't be at a canola meeting and not talk about the impact that brassicas in a, in a cover crop mix may cause problems because if said brassica has the same disease pressure and the same insect pressure as the canola that you are growing the next year or within that uh, in that rotation then we really need to make sure that we're not shortening our rotation on canola even t or making it even tighter by throwing brassicas into uh, a crop rotation or a, into the uh, cover crop mix within the rotation and of course you know how much establishment time do we have in the fall uh, are we actually going to be able to get an active, um, like an active cover crop growing? How much benefit is there? How much carbon is actually being put in the soil from a crop that gets this big? These are questions we don't have a lot of answers for, and we need more research on this to understand how we fit a, a cover crop and if a cover crop fits within our, our prairies kind of context. Um, Cover crops have been shown to use up too much moisture in a dry fall, and then you've got a dry, uh, dry summer the next year, they actually will decrease yield. Um, and that is something we need to be cautious around too. So I always fear the idea of like bringing out you know, these big ideas that are going to be the savior, right? We're gonna, we're gonna have cover crops is gonna be the solution to building soils again and building resilience. But there are some cautions around the use of them and when they may or may not actually uh, be impactful. I also added the will the cover crop affect water quality question, and that doesn't just mean will the water uh, will water quality be benefited by cover crops. I mean, will water water quality be negatively impacted because of a cover crop? Because if that cover crop sits over the winter and then during snowmelt, because we're in the prairies, um, you have phosphorus loss from that plant matter. This could actually be a problem. We've seen it. We've documented it with perennials but we haven't had a chance to document or test that yet with cover crops, but we assume that the same way that the perennial crop that's standing over winter can lose phosphorus in snowmelt, we assume that the cover crop can do the same thing. But just because we know that those can be problems doesn't mean that we're not going to still consider the use of cover crops or in this case, the use of, use of perennials as being a beneficial thing. We have highly erodible soils we need to protect. We have areas that might be very, very wet or just not good producting areas, uh, productive areas. We may have saline areas we need to manage. Perennials can be a fantastic thing to build into our rotation as well as build into the field itself. Um, and it has all sorts of benefits, benefits like, you know, the speakers after me are going to be speaking on too. Um, so we don't want to ever say no to cover crops or no to perennials or no to all these things, but we do recognize that when you have a cover crop or um, a potential water quality impact, we do have to weigh costs and benefits, and sometimes these benefits do outweigh that potential cost. So one of the things that we talk about quite often when it comes to cover crops or um, uh, perennials and things like that is again this idea of building carbon and so yes we have had a loss of soil organic matter and a loss of soil organic carbon over many years of cultivation um, and so when we make a change we can build it up again we have those benefits of tillage and different cropping strategies and fertilization practices and stuff to be able to kind of offset some of this uh, organic matter loss but we have to kind of choose wisely on what's going to work and also recognize that putting that Building organic matter, doing all of that is not something that gets done um, and we bring it right back to those natural conditions unless we're going right back to what it was. And we also can't build this forever. There is a finite amount of carbon that can be stored in the soil. We need to keep that in mind. When it comes to soil organic carbon change in Canada, I just wanted to bring this forward just to see the difference. Um, when we talk about numbers, um, see the difference in say like Eastern Canada versus the prairies. Um, we have had big increases. We still, our soils have that benefit or potential to build a lot more carbon. We also have minimal or zero till pract uh, practices and different practices that kind of um, 
increase or have added inputs uh, over time, whereas, you know, Eastern Canada, very different. Same reason why when we talk to the federal government about making programs and coming up with strategies to deal with things, we have to think about, you know, what's happening in Ontario and Quebec different than what's happening in, in the prairies. Um, but one of the big things here is tillage change. So the adoption of no-till um, or you know, minimum till has been the big pusher for what has increased carbon since the time of us basically starting cultivation. Again, it's limited in how much we can go up and we do have to kind of be aware that if we start taking tillage back in essentially or taking away some of these practices, we do lose that carbon that we have built over time. So quickly, I want to uh, come back to this slide or this image of those eroded knolls. And this is something that uh, we want to talk about in terms of uh, the impact of tillage uh, and tillage erosion, because yes, tillage, we lose organic matter. With tillage, the active tillage burns off organic matter. Um, but at the same time, not only do we lose it potentially across the field, we also move it around by moving topsoil. And we move that higher organic matter soil to the bottom of the hill, and we lose it from the top, and we lose so much productivity because of this. And I'm not talking about big landscapes here, um, but there's a lot of potential. Uh, this is just images from 2018 at our crop diagnostic school looking at how far we could actually drag uh, corn seed in this in this case um, uh, with the movement of tillage uh, tillage implements and here is a few days later where you could actually see the the greenness of the corn actually um, emerging from that center line and we either went up the slope or down the slope uh, ultimately, soil moves no matter which direction you're going up or down the slope, and we can drag soil around a fair bit. The problem with the loss of that topsoil is that you have a loss of organic matter, um, and that organic matter has nutrients. And so if you have a clay loam soil or a soil that has higher clay content in it, you can make up for the loss of that organic matter or loss of topsoil by just adding nutrients. That's what they did here. They added one times or two times the fertilizer kind of requirement of the crop and got yield back, even though they had taken up to eight inches of topsoil off um, in this experiment. If you were dealing with sandier soils, you can't gain back everything with the nutrients alone, because it's not just about the loss of the nutrient in the topsoil, it's the loss of the organic matter, the loss of the water holding capacity and the loss of all of those other benefits. And so in this case, it doesn't matter how much fertilizer you're throwing at it, it's really hard to regain in a sandier soil um, that loss of topsoil. So what are you gonna do? You are going to put the soil back, right, where it came from. Um, this is, an, again, the same experiment we had done or a demonstration in 2018 at Crop Diagnostic School in Carmen, Manitoba. And we had our kind of business as usual tillage. So in all of these images I'm showing um, on the, what would be to you the left side of me, um, we had no starter pea with our corn. And then on the right side of me, there was starter pea. So you're seeing an impact between the four rows, which is what the, the plot size was, um, of the impact of having some starter, uh, starter foss. This is business as usual tillage. This is where we had eroded the soil. And so you can see already how much shorter, and yes, there's a really tall, I've got three meter sticks taped together in order to hold and show the height of the crop. Um, this shows the impact now of eroding that topsoil. This is where we had actually restored the topsoil, where we took soil from the bottom of the hill and kind of put it back on the top of the hill. And here you're starting to see even that benefit of the starter pea even like disappear a little bit because we've got more organic matter, but also more nutrients coming along with that organic matter. And I throw this in just to be able to say that, yes, this is the reason why I had three meter sticks uh, stuck together. Um, this is the bottom of the hill where we took the soil away, but we're not actually seeing an impact, a negative impact on the crop. So the reason why we see an overall benefit is because, again, where we're adding the soil back to the top or restoring, we're actually adding some of that natural nutrition that comes along with that topsoil. We've added organic matter and we're not necessarily taking away from the bottom the way that we thought you potentially think you could just by taking some of that topsoil away. Because if a lot of that topsoil at the bottom of the hill over years was deposited, it's so thick that you can actually remove some of it. 
So David Lobb at the University of Manitoba has done a lot of research looking at uh, soil landscape restoration. And so where they have added soil to the knoll, this was work done with peas, wheat, flax um, in the rotation. They're now doing work, I think, with corn or with corn and soybeans, because the question is, how does this impact other crops? Um, but getting like 64% increase in pea yield and 133% increase in wheat yield on those knolls where they had just taken that soil and put it back up. And not seeing a significant impact in the low-lying areas where they took the soil from, with the exception of uh, the flax, where they saw a little bit of a significant difference. It really comes down to the way that they had done it, where they kind of ponded a bit of water, and so or ponded in the bottom where they had taken the soil out. And so then, if they don't like wet feet, then that was more the impact than anything else. But not due to the loss of the topsoil, because there was plenty of soil left behind. Um, so. I can, uh, you want me to wrap it up there? I'm probably at the end of my time. Um, the, the last little bit here, um, I really wanted to focus more on the landscape restoration was just to talk about the idea of, you know, how do we know we're making a difference? And I'm going to leave it at this slide um, because the question for me comes down to what is it that, what's the difference we were trying to make in the first place? So when we talk about moving that soil back to the top of the hill or thinking about the variability um, within the field, and we're talking about things like let's adopt you know, let's adopt no-till, let's adopt cover crops, let's adopt perennials, let's build soil. The reason why I talk about moving the soil back up to the top of the hill is because you instantly can get the benefit back from the, the soil being kind of replaced where it had come from the beginning. If we are thinking we're going to wait for that soil to rebuild at the top of the hill, we have a long time to wait. You can adopt the no-till, you can adopt the cover crops, you can do all the soil building practices in the world. It takes time for soil to build. The only way that we can kind of speed that process up is by a lot of additions. And so if we're gonna move, like, Moving along, you're going to throw a lot of compost, manure, whatever it is, up on the top of the hill or across the field. Then by doing that, you're actually kind of adding stuff that you're not just waiting for that soil to build, if that makes sense. It took 10,000 years for the soil to become what it was in the first place. We can't expect that it's going to fix itself overnight with these practices. In a case like this, um, where you are dealing with things like erosion or tillage, or tillage erosion in this case, if you take the soil from the bottom of the hill and you put it back on the top of the hill, you've put the topsoil back where it came from, now adopt the practice, and now we have le a little less soil variability in the field to deal with. So rather than writing off those top areas or assuming that we can just fix it by adding different nutrients, like we saw with the erosion graphs, um, we can actually improve that growth then adopt the practice and maintain that growth. Um, and so when we're looking at what has happened afterwards and whether these practices we're, we're bringing in have actually made a difference, you know, we're looking at things like crop yield and observations, but ultimately we're seeing all these other soil observations that we can also con consider. But for me, it comes down to what the grower is looking for, what the grower wants to get out of that field, whether it is improved productivity, whether it's having increased habitat, whether it, whatever it is, it really comes down to making a decision, a site by site kind of, a site specific, let's say, uh, um, decision uh, across that entire field. So I'm sure we'll talk more about that as we get into uh, some of the questions afterwards, but I will pass it off and, uh, there'll be a lot more variability to be talked about in the next little bit. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Marla. <clears throat> so our next uh, uh, speaker is David Wetter from AgriEarth Consulting, and he's gonna be talking about tile drainage. Is it right for you? And so David is a uh, principal soil scientist, which is actually a pedologist, and an agroecologist, agroecologist and registered professional agrologist. He has over 20 years of consulting experience in agriculture and environmental planning, he had permitting, management, decommissioning, and with a technical focus on soil landscape environment, agricultural management systems, and agricultural water management. Thank you. Okay, but thank you for the introduction, Jason, and uh, certainly a tough act to follow uh, behind uh, Marla Reekman's shoes in terms of uh, 
a um, bit of a soil extension guru. Um, but, it, but she introduced our, the, the topic of uh, soil variability and uh, some of the other themes I'll be talking about today around tile drainage. And uh, tile drainage to me is just another tool in the, uh, the vast toolbox that our, our producers have to, to manage our, our complex landscapes. Um, so uh, Jason mentioned my topic was, was tile drainage. Is it right for you? Spoiler, um, th that's going to be up to ultimately up to the producers if it's right for them. And again, ties into to variability. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a, a pretty uh, basic overview of tile drainage. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, the basic design parameters just for, for people that maybe aren't that familiar with tile drainage. I'll talk about some of the soil landscape considerations and uh, end off with some cost and benefits. Okay, so getting into the, to the overview of tile drainage. So uh, just you know, very basically, what is tile drainage? And it, it's simply the reduction of excess water in the crop rooting zone um, by lowering shallow water tables. And that's, that's a pretty important concept. And I think uh, people that aren't familiar with tile drainage don't, don't maybe understand that well. Um, tile drainage is simply the, the placement of perforated uh, pipes underground, uh, typically below the rooting zone, and uh, if those pipes aren't intercepting a water table or saturated soil conditions, they are uh, not an effective practice. So uh, that image on the, the bottom right of the screen there shows um, conceptually uh, what this looks like, this improvement, uh, where on the left side we have a water table that's um, preventing that, that healthy kind of uh, uh, crop root growth environment and with the implementation of tile drainage it's pulling that water table down allowing uh, uh, crop roots to to uh, get get to the depth they need to get to do their their job of, of uh, growing a healthy plant so why why tile drain so obviously um, it's a practice to be implemented in, in areas of the landscape where we have excess water uh, there's a number of, of benefits to tile drainage certainly increasing yields is is kind of first and and foremost in, in most uh, producers' minds. However, there's, a, there's a, a, a bunch of other benefits there too that can potentially be, be accrued. So uh, getting onto that land earlier in the season, so earlier seeding, improved field access uh, in, the, in the spring period and following heavy rainfalls is, is beneficial as well. Uh, certainly through the through, uh, growing season, following heavy rainfalls, uh, a reduction in, in uh, risk of crop losses from, from excess water in season. And some of the other things we don't often talk about uh, you know, just in, in those uh, marginal or drainage impacted areas of the landscape, improving that, that nutrient use efficiency. So in these areas where we're maybe applying uh, inputs that, um, you know, certain certain number of years um, um, through our, our crop growing seasons are, are negatively impacted by water and, and aren't producing a crop and leaving those inputs in the ground, um, tile can allow in certain situations for those inputs to be used more effectively. And um, Marla talked about uh, improvement of soil health and, and tile can, can uh, improve soil health in certain circumstances when looking at things like salinity, um, compaction around wet soils and that type of thing. So for those that haven't heard the, the golden rule of drainage, it's, uh, it's drain only what is necessary for crop, good crop growth and trafficability and not one drop more. So it's in no one's best interest to, to uh, drain off more water than you have to for good crop growth. And, and send that water uh, down the line. Now we're kind of into the era, certainly uh, south of the border in the US where they're a little further along, I think the, the curve, um, uh, conservation drainage. And that kind of takes it that step further and considers uh, approaches and practices to, to minimize those downstream impacts. Okay, uh, I'm from Winnipeg and we're in Saskatoon and we hopped off the plane uh, last night and it was uh, minus 34 here, um, minus 32 when I left Winnipeg. So, I mean, that really underscores that we are in, in cold climates here in our prairies in particular. And that's significant when it comes to tile drainage because our soils are frozen for a good portion of the year, typically November through March. Um, soils, or water's not moving through those soils. And we, typically when we get into the uh, spring melt period, our soils are still frozen and the majority of that water uh, runs off the land. So a lot of our water movement through our landscapes is, is decoupled from uh, tile drainage when, when tile is installed in the field. Uh, that's important because a lot of the, the body of knowledge, the literature research, and, and some of our BMPs are, are generated out of, out of the US, in, in the US Midwest in particular. 
And, um, you know, it's certainly different how uh, water moves through and, and uh, uh, over our landscapes and through our soil. So that has ramifications for things like uh, drainage timing, uh, water quantity, and water quality as well. So something to keep in mind. Okay, I'll just shift into some basic uh, design considerations. Uh, so a tile drainage system is it's a pretty simple uh, system of plumbing. Uh, there, there's three main components, and, and first there's there's an outlet. So every every tile drainage system needs an outlet, and uh, these can be a gravity outlet or a pumped outlet. But that's essentially where where the water leaves the field and enters into typically a, a ditch, um, maybe into a uh, a surface water stream, or it could be uh, draining over land, um, uh, you know, down a regional kind of slope gradient. Our, our main lines are, are the main um, um, non-perforated pipes that, that uh, collect water from, from the laterals in the field, and the laterals are the, the pipes that are distributed throughout the field, perforated pipes that do the job of, of collect, collecting that excess water. So uh, just... Uh, I'll speak for a moment on the uh, drainage outlets that, you know, they're critical. I mean, if, if you don't have a good drainage outlet, you don't have a good drainage project. It's as simple as that. Uh, two types of, of outlets. We've got a gravity outlet where that regional elevation, uh, relief and grade allows just the gravity flow of water um, that's collected from the field um, downstream. Where we don't have that elevation, which is uh, typical in, in lots of areas in our, in our flatter landscapes, like in the Red River Valley, um, we often need pumped outlets to get to, to bring that water up from a sump and uh, kind of get it over the hump into a, into a drainage ditch. So uh, when thinking about a drainage outlet, this is the time to really consider the potential for downstream impacts and, and uh, receptors that may be impacted. And uh, certainly talking to neighbours is, is an important step of the process and it's embedded in some of our regulatory requirements as well, certainly in Manitoba. The, the drainage coefficient is, it's, it's a number that just describes the maximum rate of, of water removal from a field, and it's a, it's a design parameter and an objective as well. So um, it's important because it, it uh, dictates or affects the performance of the drainage system, as well as um, it makes an impact to the pocketbook as well. So um, typical drainage coefficients in Manitoba, or sorry, across the, the prairies, I should say, in the, the brown box there, on the lower end, we typically start with about a 3 16 inch per day uh, coefficient. Uh, a quarter inch a day is, is probably the most common, and uh, you know up to about 3 eighths of an inch uh, per day. Some drainage coefficients down in, in the, the U.S. are higher, but they wouldn't be typical in our region here. An important note here is that um, as we go from a lower to a higher drainage coefficient, the systems drain off more water. They drain it off more rapidly, and um, and they cost more money as well. So uh, selection of a drainage coefficient is influenced by a number of factors, like climate, how much rainfall we get, when we get it, how big the events are, our soil variability, of course, uh, soil texture, hydraulic conductivity, um, as well as management system considerations, such as the crop rotation, crop types for growing, sensitivity of crops to, to excess water, uh, or tolerance, uh, maybe I should say, as well as the economics of the operation. Okay, drain, drain depth is another important design consideration. Uh, typically, the uh, minimum cover is two and a half feet just to protect the integrity of, of the pipe. The typical range in, in uh, our lateral line depths are, are three to four feet. Um, it's important when, when uh, considering depth of tile to consider the potential for restrictive layers, and, and Marla mentioned a few of the, the issues that might be behind that compaction and, and soil structural issues in that. We want to be careful uh, to understand if there are restrictive layers in the field and, and not to place those tiles below a restrictive layer or we may have some uh, serious uh, issues around performance. Another note here around uh, drain depth is that the, the deeper the drain, uh, the more water is going to be drained off. So certainly from a water conservation perspective, that a shallow placement is, is preferable. So kind of as shallow as we can put those pipes while still achieving the, the objectives of, uh, of our drainage program. Another factor to consider is, is drain spacing. So there's a, a, a bit of a dated uh, diagram there, but uh, I think it's, it's useful as well. Um, essentially, when, when tiles are put in, they, they pull down the water table, but they create a, a water table 
mound between the tiles. So kind of that midpoint between tiles, you've got the highest water table. So those, the, uh, between the depth and the spacing, we're trying to design a system that pulls that, that mounded water table um, below that root, rooting zone um, sufficiently so that, so that we're creating that uh, kind of uh, aerated environment for, uh, for uh, root growth. Um, if you get that spacing too far apart, uh, essentially that, that mound takes a little too long to, to draw down and we can have some, some damage kind of midpoint between the tiles and probably anyone that's looked at uh, tile kind of mid-season in the field, you can see a bit of an undulation and cropping pattern and that's kind of the mechanism that's at play there. Another note as well is that, um, you know, we're often draining what we call imperfectly drained soils. And some recent research um, in Manitoba has uh, demonstrated the importance of, of uh, shallow water tables to feeding the crop, particularly in, in droughty areas. So we've got soils that have a excess water limitation as well as a moisture limitation. So again, that's just reinforcing the importance to, to get that depth as shallow as we can while still having an effective drainage system. Okay, I'll talk now about um, some of the soil landscape considerations. And again, Marla did a a great job of, of introducing some of the issues here and um, as Marla stated earlier talking about uh, precision agriculture and and uh, coming up with all these colorful maps um, you know we're talking about some of the factors that that are behind some of those those colors we see so this is a, an oblique uh, photo taken in southwest Manitoba uh, around Harton area just a few miles up the road from uh, where my cousin Jay Wetter grew up um, it's also a, it's a site we're doing a research and demonstration project on, on uh, tile drainage in undulating landscapes, which is supported by Manitoba canola growers and some of our other commodity organizations in Manitoba. So a shout out to them. Um, so, you know, th this isn't the type of uh, picture we typically see on the, the glossy brochures marketing uh, canola, but it's, you know, it is the reality in a lot of our variability going from in this landscape anyway from well drained at the the upper slopes down through moderately well to imperfect to poorly drained at, at the lower slopes uh, that has ramifications again on that that depth to water table which is of critical importance it's what we're trying to manage with tile drainage and um, it's good to understand the variability around that certainly won't pay to put tile in where where that water table isn't interacting with with our crop rooting zone We've got natural surface drainage features, wetlands, potholes. Um, we have, uh, in the case of this field in, in the corner, we've got patches of soil salinity that, you know, in, in that area where it's highlighted, we've got no growth areas and, and limitations kind of going up the slope from there. And then other issues lurking be beneath that we can't see. So things like compaction, structural issues, and, and sodicity as well. So tile will, will help with some of these um, limitations. It'll exacerbate um, issues in other cases, specifically uh, or potentially exacerbate, uh, exacerbate, particularly around sodicity, and uh, it'll be kind of a neutral effect or no effect in, in other uh, around other limitations. So, when it comes to um, the dynamic relationship between topography, soil drainage, and, and depth to water table, it's it's important to kind of understand that that interplay when considering. Uh, tile drainage decisions, particularly around uh, layout and then getting into issues around spacing that. So um, the combination again of surficial topography and, and, and soil texture largely determine so the uh, surface water redistribution in the landscape represented by the brown arrows on that, that soil landscape model and uh, as well as the internal drainage. So um, imposed on that, that landscape model, there's uh, blue coloring to represent the relatively poor uh, drainage uh, class areas of landscape. Orange is kind of getting into that imperfect uh, drainage uh, class and then and then the well drained are in the kind of yellow or taupe uh, 
uh, color there in the upper portions of the landscape. So, so tile drainage, and, and uh, we should mention that tile drainage is a complementary practice to surface drainage, and surface drainage should always be uh, considered first if, if uh, a producer is wanting to implement drainage improvements. Um, but, you know, they can, they can effectively reduce uh, drainage limitations and again focusing on the imperfectly and, and poorly drained portions of the landscape. Soil salinity, it's a significant management issue in the prairies in particular. Uh, the diagram there on the screen just shows you, you know, kind of a conceptual mechanism of, of soil salinity development. And the potential for soil salinity development occurs where, where we have that interaction between a water table and that capillary fringe that, um, where the soils can pull water upwards from the water table, interaction between that water table and, and the surface. So we have evaporation um, removing water from that surface and if there are salts uh, in, that, uh, in that groundwater then those salts can be deposited at the soil surface. So over time this can result in, in significant salt buildup in certain areas of the landscape and, and limiting concentrations of, of salt in the soil. So tile drainage is, is one of the um, effective reclamation approaches uh, for salinity. So essentially with the installation of those drains we pull that water table down so that we're removing that interaction between the water table and the, and the surface of the soil and uh, um, salts are flushed out of the tiles um, through that process and it also allows for, for um, additional infiltration through the soil profile and, and the flushing of salts through the, through the impacted uh, soil root zone as well. I'm in Saskatchewan, so I thought I'd better add this oft-used uh, quote from Les Henry, that the only real reclamation procedure for saline soils is to drain the excess water off the bottom and pour fresh water on the top to flush the salts out and out in a way. So, um, you know, tile does provide a means to do that. Um, and salt is certainly an issue across the prairies. This, just anywhere there's uh, kind of a darker pink or getting into red shading, there are areas that are at at uh, kind of moderate to, to high risk of, of salinization across the prairies. Now, soil salinity reclamation is a long-term process. Um, so, you know, this is another misconception, I think, around tile is that, is that uh, tile can be a, a magic and quick fix for soil salinity, and that's, that's not uh, typically the case. So, uh, this is a graphic just showing some long-term salinity monitoring follow, following tile drainage improvements at a site south of Winkler, Manitoba. So um, if you look up at the top left corner, 1995 was kind of that baseline. You can see uh, significant areas of that field are impacted by, by weak and moderate uh, salinity in the green and, and uh, it's showing up, I guess, as orange on the screen here, uh, weak and moderately, moderately saline soil. So uh, following the implementation of, of tile drainage in this field, if you, if you look at the, at the figure or the image in the, in the center of the figure, in 2011, so 16 years later, you can see a significant reduction of, of the degree and extent of salinity in that field. But again, this is over a 16 year period. So uh, tile can be an effective uh, tool to reduce uh, salinity, um, but it's a long-term process. Um, so just uh, talk briefly about SODIC and, and solanetsic soils. It's really an issue that's um, primarily lim limited to Saskatchewan and Alberta. There's some pretty major, major areas affected uh, by this. So SODIC or solanetsic soils are soils that have a high, high amounts of, of sodium and sodium acts to disperse clays in, in the soil and allows those trays, clays to leach down or translocate down and they can create uh, these columnar um, or poorly structured B horizons just under, under the topsoil. And those, those poorly structured um, soils can, can really restrict water and penetration as, as Marla was talking about earlier. So certainly when considering tile drainage, it's, it's, it's really uh, important to understand if you have solanetsic soils. So if you, if you don't get that infiltration, then uh, tiles aren't able to do their, their work. Um, tiles can also, in certain circumstances, exacerbate this issue where Tiles can, pr can promote, promote the um, removal of soluble salts from the profile and, and um, basically it, it disrupts the, the existing balance of, of salts and can, can actually worsen these, um, the sodium issue in these soils. 
However, tile can also be part of a, a, a managed solution um, to reclaiming uh, solenetic soils, but I'm not going to get into that uh, based on the time here. Anyway, uh, complicated issues around solenetic soils. Uh, good news is that uh, you know, there's a bunch of assessment tools out there that producers can use to support uh, tile management decisions. So first and foremost is, is producer knowledge, and this, this shouldn't be understated. So producers know, typically know their fields inside and out, um, may not uh, always understand the mechanisms behind some of the, the issues, but they certainly know where the issues are and, and typically have a pretty good handle on, on what's, uh, what's behind that. Uh, yield maps are, you know, I think an underutilized tool and uh, um, using yield maps to uh, determine profitability as well. Um, you know, I think underutilized tools for supporting these types of decisions, but uh, again, we have to understand what's underlying yield, yield uh, reductions or yield potential reductions before making decisions on how to fix it, right? Um, soil investigations are, are pretty important. So we have tools like the EM38 or Varus where we can do, where we can make these fancy <coughs> colorful maps and uh, it's important to couple that with with uh, soil inspections to understand what what those what those factors are behind those uh, the different colors um, geologic or stratigraphy investigation is pretty important as well there's some risks um, associated with with uh, shallow geologies that should be understood uh, another pretty simple tool and cost effective is, is just installing some plastic monitoring wells and uh, real-time water table sensors. If, if you're thinking about uh, tile drainage, just understanding that dynamic of, of, of your, the water tables across your, your field. So, you know, this is where, you know, small investment, I think, up front can, can yield big returns in what's a pretty significant investment on the farm. Other considerations that I won't go into today are wetlands, landscape uh, biodiversity, and, and of course regulatory uh, requirements. I think Mark may be touching on some of the, the kind of natural uh, uh, environment aspects as well in his talk. So just um, getting close to wrapping up here, just some of the getting to some of the benefits and costs, and uh, around economic benefits, there's there's actually. Uh, Surprisingly, it seems to be a dearth of, of information around return on investment for, for tile drainage, which is, a, which is surprising considering the, the magnitude of the investment. Um, uh, study, I guess a liter more of a literature review done by uh, Gary Sands out of University of Minnesota is informative, um, you know, dated information into the kind of the early to mid 80s, but um, you know, data from Iowa, Ohio and Ontario all kind of showed in that kind of 10 to 20% increase in, in yields following tile drainage. And then a more recent uh, look at um, uh, clay soils in, in North Dakota, um, where they, they didn't actually look at tile, they looked at dry land production and, and production affected by saturated soils and determined about a 19% uh, yield loss due to excess water, so which, which implies if you remove that limitation that, that you can expect a similar type of a bump in yield. So, I mean, that's, you know, uh, kind of the range in, in uh, yield increases where uh, this practice is implemented, where it is actually that drainage limitation that's, that's pulling those yields down. Um, here's a figure from uh, Manitoba Agriculture just showing the impact of delayed seeding on our yields. You can see canola in there in, in the dark blue amongst a bunch of other annual crops. So, um, Essentially, it's just showing, you know, once you get into that, beyond that second week of May, there's significant reductions in, in yield potential, um, you know, in the order of 5 to 10 percent of, of yield reduction per week, depending on, on the crop. So, I mean, that becomes pretty significant if tile can help producers get, get on that, that field a week or two earlier, um, you know, the obvious benefit there. When it comes to economics, I mean, the typical range in cost for a system is 1,000 to 1,500 an acre, plus or minus. It depends on a number of factors, including uh, design considerations like your drainage coefficient, lateral spacing, and so on. Um, certainly a big investment, and um, you know, the point here is that producer due diligence is, is important in, in terms of uh, you know, understanding those objectives, understanding what, what that return might be for them based on their operation. And, um, you know, in terms of shopping around, just uh, contractors install the systems and just like any industry, there's, um, you know, a range in, in contractors in terms of expertise and, and knowledge in, in different areas of our soil landscapes. 
Just getting into some more of the, the, the downstream impacts, I, you know, um, my interpretation is that, you know, tile drainage can, is an incremental shift of, of the, uh, the managed agricultural field water balance. So um, what it does is, is promote infiltration, and in so doing, it, it reduces surface runoff and, and uh, you know, in the magnitude of uh, 29 to 45 percent in, in the case of some uh, work done again by Gary Sands uh, out of University of Minnesota. Um, you know, it, it adds um, a, a mechanism of that tile flow or, or short circuits, kind of a natural uh, process in terms of capturing that, that water that's infiltrating through the soil profile and, and um, passing that through to surface water. Um, it decreases in terms of, of downstream water quantity, it, it uh, tends to decrease the, the peak surface flow, so it kind of knocks the top off of those peak flows because it does slow down uh, the movement of, of water off a field, so in the order of 15 to 30 percent. Um, but it does on the other, kind of the other uh, uh, side of the equation, it does increase our total runoff. So. It, it, what it does is extends that kind of hydrograph and, and typically results in around a 5 to 10 percent increase in, that, in the total runoff from a field. In terms of, of water quality, sorry, I'll just, I got an alarm here. Tells me there's three minutes left. Um, in terms of water quality, um, tile can, because it does reduce that surface runoff component, it can have uh, beneficial effects on, on uh, sediment uh, loss from the field. So sometimes a picture says a thousand words and this photo's compliments of uh, a colleague of mine, Bruce Schufelt from PBS Water. So just showing on the left-hand side, uh, during a, uh, following a major rainfall event, um, you know, we can get sedimentation from surface runoff in the murky water there where it's, where it's meeting up with some tile discharge that it's uh, relatively clear, so. This is work, uh, fairly recent work done in, in uh, southern Manitoba. Again, it's, it's in our heavy clay, Red River uh, crack and clay soils. And there's a series of, of pie charts at the bottom there showing, it's showing the relative contribution uh, of water and nutrient um, in runoff from surface runoff in orange and tile discharge in blue. So the, the uh, pie chart on the left-hand side is just showing our total runoff from the field. So that's just showing that in the orange there, uh, somewhere around 80% um, of the total runoff from the field is occurring as surface runoff. And again, this is, this is connected to um, largely to our frozen soils and, and the snowmelt period and, and how uh, that water runs off our fields in the cold climates. In terms of nutrient, um, and it's connected to the total flow, uh, a lot of our, the vast majority of the phosphorus that's running off the field, again, is, is in that surface runoff. Uh, with a small component in, in, in our tile discharge. Different story with, with uh, nitrate, a little more soluble. Um, and, you know, uh, tile can have a, uh, it provides a greater contribution of that total uh, field runoff um, of nitrate when in a tile drainage uh, scenario. Uh, the researchers concluded here that overland flow, again, is a primary pathway for runoff and, and total runoff and nutrient loss in, in these environments. Most nutrient loss is, is occurring during that spring uh, snow melt period, as well as following significant rainfall events. Um, they also concluded tile drainage is unlikely to exacerbate pea losses from, from uh, these heavy clay soils. And uh, however, they may enhance nitrogen loading in this region. Uh, just a real quick note, uh, salinity is obviously a, an issue as well when we're uh, draining saline soils. Those salts are going to end up in, in our, our tile discharge um, and potential for downstream impacts to both land and, and surface water. So it's good to understand that going into it. And uh, just another note here, it's you know, relatively high initial salt concentrations and those will, will typically decrease over time as that salt is removed from the soil. And just wrapping up here, just a quick note on, on beneficial practices. One of the, the benefits of tile is it takes, um, at least for a component of the flow, a non-point source flow and, and uh, converts that to a point source. So that provides a bit of opportunity for application of BMPs. Um, when we're thinking of BMPs around tile, we think of conserving water, or reducing the quantity of water that runs off, improving the water quality from nutrients and salinity, and then improving soil health. So there's two kind of buckets of BMPs. When it comes to tile, there's what we call infield BMPs. Uh, this starts with the design and layout of the system. 
um, but it also it um, speaks to to more of the, the ag agronomic management on the field. Of course, we've talked about for our nutrient management. Today, we talked about soil health and, and cover crops. One tool in the in the tile drainage toolbox is controlled drainage, which allows us to uh, stop the flow following um, that spring runoff period um, and, and, and back up that, that flow. Uh, however, it's limited to pretty flat landscapes, typically less than, than 1%, so it's uh, not an effective practice in our variable landscapes. Uh, and then we have edge of field BMP. So again, these are things we can kind of tack on that, that pipe at the edge of field. So we have things like bioreactors and phosphorus removal uh, filter structures to, to kind of scrub the water of, of a portion of the nutrients before it goes into the surface waters. Tile water recycling is, is becoming uh, a practice that, that people are, are becoming interested in. Capture that water and then put it back on the land through irrigation, either surface irrigation or, or sub-irrigation. And there's other tools such as saturated buffer, which is an effective tool to uh, reduce our nitrogen concentration and discharge, just allowing that water to kind of filter through a natural vegetation buffer, and implementation of constructed wetlands that have the potential mainly for nitrogen removal, but uh, can also be used for phosphorus removal if we take that vegetation. So, in summary, uh, tile drainage it can be effective practice to increase productivity in some of our, our marginal acres of production. Um, you know, really where, where we have those drainage limited soils and, and site specific factors are really going to determine if, if uh, it's right for you. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time today and uh, we'll take some questions during the panel discussion. Thanks. Thanks very much, David, and uh, yeah, sign me up. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll do some acres. Um, so our next speaker is um, uh, Dr. Mark McConnell. He uh, uh, does the uh, uplands bird work with uh, Mississippi State, and uh, so he's going to be talking about converting unproductive acres to, uh, to wildlands. And so uh, uh, Dr. Mark is an assistant professor of upland birds at Mississippi State University. And he's an expert on the role of precision agriculture and conservation in farm level profitability. He's published uh, re research evaluating the economic ec outcomes of conservation enrollment using precision agriculture technology. And he has since published multiple papers illustrating how precision agriculture technology can identify overlap in conservation and economic opportunities in agricultural landscape. So Mark, it's uh, floor is yours. Thank you all for letting me come out here today. So as he said, I'm not a precision ag specialist. I am not a uh, agronomist. I'm a wildlife ecologist by training. And I just happened to get into the precision ag world several years ago, about 14, 15 years ago with my master's work. And it's kind of become a, a large part of my research program. So everything I say today, just remember, I'm acknowledging I'm not a precision ag expert per se. I'm a wildlife ecologist who uses precision ag as, as, a, as a tool for some of the research that I do. Uh, and real quick, I just want to acknowledge my research associate, Ryan Mann, who helped me uh, put together some of this. So it's been interesting to hear a lot of these talks, especially with the previous panel and this one. There's a lot of reoccurring themes that I'm going to hit on, but just from a slightly different angle. So when I lecture in, in class, I like to start my lectures off with a little bit of philosophy, and then we follow it up with a little bit of evidence. So the guy pictured here, many of you may or may not know, this is Otto Leopold. He's the father of wildlife management in, in, the, in the U.S. and essentially the first professionally trained wildlife biologist, but he knew something that a lot of wildlife biologists now don't seem to pay attention to. He understood the need to work with agricultural producers to make sure that landowners, farmers, are benefiting from the things we recommend as a wildlife manager. So he's got this great quote, and I was always told never to read a quote when, there's, when the quote's up on the slide. So I'll let you just look at it while I ramble. But essentially it comes down to understanding what is good for the environment and what is good for the landowner and making sure it's economically, uh, it's economically beneficial. And I'm gonna have a few quotes from uh, Aldo Leopold throughout this talk that are gonna tie into my general explanation. If you haven't read his book, A Sand County Almanac, it's one of the greatest uh, conservation, collection of conservation essays uh, probably ever published. And uh, he, was, he, he didn't consider himself a philosopher, but he very much was one. And uh, the entire field of landscape ecology, uh, he essentially developed before it was even a field. Uh, so he's a hugely impactful person to, to the profession. So 
I've got to make some assumptions to make this talk work, okay? I've been doing precision ag work in the precision conservation realm for about 15 years, and it's all predicated on some assumptions. So what I'm going to do to start my talk is I'm going to walk you through these assumptions and then kind of give, provide what I consider is the evidence for them, and it kind of leads up to the results I'll show you at the end from some of my research to illustrate that uh, I didn't just make all this up, okay? So the first one is there's enough unproductive, and I'm going to interchange the word unproductive or marginal farmland quite often, but it's been a reoccurring theme throughout the day. But marginal farmland seems to be an acceptable term. There's enough of this on the landscape that this is a, an enormous management issue. If it wasn't an management issue, we wouldn't be having these, all these lectures today talking about it, okay? So let's talk about the extent of that. This is a recent paper uh, published by Bruno Basso's lab out of uh, Michigan State. He does tremendous remote sensing precision ag work. And he looked across nine or 10 states in the, in the Midwest uh, and looked at yield patterns over time. And what he found was across these, I think it's 10 states, across these 10 states and the agricultural uh, fields there, 26% of, of, of the subfield regions were what he called stable low yield, meaning they were low yields year after year after year, okay? That number alone just made my day. Like when this, when this hit, it was like, man, I, okay, I've been saying this, but I didn't have the ability to do that kind of research because I'm not nearly as smart as his lab, but that was huge. 29% of it was actually unstable low yield, which means that some years it was high yield, some years it was low yield. That's a whole other issue. Let's just focus on 26% of the landscape uh, being low yield. And what you'll see is a lot of these maps they produced are very similar to the several of the profit or, or yield maps we've seen today, right? It's spotty in fields. It's often constant in your field, field edges. We'll get into that later. But that's a significant amount of the landscape that is essentially less than uh, ideal uh, yield and probably uh, reducing profit. Similar research from Christopher Bobrick's uh, uh, precision ag work that was published in the Journal of Precision Agriculture just a few years ago in Missouri, where he looked at uh, soil vulnerability and variability in terms of yield. And what he found was, uh, just at a state level, tremendous amount of the soil in this red area here, it's highly variable in productivity and it's highly vulnerable. And we tend to see that combination. Variable soils are, are highly vulnerable and they cause uh, some challenges to the farming landscape. So, it's not just that there's some marginal pieces here and there. This is a ubiquitous problem in the ag landscape, and it's, it's worthy of, 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 of addressing. Then you take some recent work uh, the, from uh, uh, Dr. Lark, who's recently uh, published this paper on the, I guess, y'all's left. We're still in a phase of agricultural expansion in the U.S. I don't know how it works here, but in the U.S., we've actually still, we're still expanding. And where we're expanding into is actually some marginal acres, acres that were probably farmed a long time ago and someone stopped farming for obvious reasons, or in the rare case, areas that had not been farmed yet, that with the commodity prices when they boom, people say, hey, let me, let's take that out of production and see if I can make some money off of it. The publication on the left was published a few years ago during, right after the, uh, the economic boom we had in the corn and soybean market in 2010, 2011. And you'll notice those areas with the, hash, the, the, the slanted lines, that's a conservation reserve program land, and I'll mention this later in our talk. But in the U.S., in our farm bill, we have a conservation title in the farm bill that allows farmers to get paid to take land out of production. And a lot of marginal land was taken out of production when it started in 1985. It gets re-upped about every five years, depending on the stagnation in Congress. And when the corn prices and soybean prices hit that peak in 2010-2011, a lot of CRP acres that were under contract got plowed under and put back into production, right? And what we found is they, you know, prices were that high. They still, you know, they were profitable. But these were put into taken out of production for a reason. They were marginal farmland to start with. But in high commodity prices, you can still make a profit on some of that. It doesn't last forever, and when prices went back down a few years ago, these farmers went straight back to trying to re-enroll it, and you know that was a whole other drama story. But the point is, these marginal acres exist at a, at a, at a large spatial scale that is worthy of our attention. The second, second assumption I want to focus on is the magnitude of economic loss that occurs on these marginal acres. It's quite substantial. I think every speaker today, because I've been taking notes, because this has been fascinating for me, has mentioned that farmers tend to know where their tough spots are, where their challenging areas are. I completely agree. I've looked at uh, over a thousand uh, profit and yield maps in my short career, and what I can tell you is that I've never identified a part of a field a farmer didn't know about, ever. What I have done is shown them the magnitude of economic loss that was quite surprising to them. So they know it's a low yielding area. They might not know how much money per acre they're losing on that particular, re and, and the ex extent of it. So 
this is, I've just taken a selection of really pretty profit maps from some of my research published work. Uh, some of these are from the alluvial plain of the Mississippi Valley, some are from the uh, Blackland Prairie region of Mississippi. And what you'll find is, and I'll just make a note, every profit map I'm gonna show you here is a profitable field. The field itself is generating positive revenue. But there are some, some serious challenges on these fields and we've highlighted these. So if it's red in these, we've got the scale of this to where this is net negative revenue. The farmer's actually losing money on these red acres. Now the farmers knew these acres were there. They didn't necessarily know how much money they were losing and sometimes it can be quite substantial. The, the picture on the, the right there is from the, a prairie site uh, despite all those trees. <laughs> and, uh, the picture on the left there is definitely from uh, what we, we call Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta, although it's not a delta, but don't get me started on that. Uh, it's the alluvial floodplain. Again, even on center pivot areas, we've got low yielding areas, low profit areas. Uh, sometimes there are big areas that, and I, like I said, I'm not an agronomist. I don't know what the issue here is. I'm sure the farmer does. They give me this yield data, we illustrate it for them. But then on the picture of the, the smaller field there, sometimes it's just really concentrated. It's not near the edge much at all. It's just a serious challenge they have in that field. And in all these cases, the farmers were losing to the tune of more than uh, 50 to sometimes over $150 per acre that they were losing, right? They were putting more into that acre than they, could, where they were making off of it based off yield, okay? To me, as easy, even as an ecologist, that I don't want to have to see a farmer go through that. that that's challenging for me. The third assumption is uh, that farming these marginal acres does have some negative environmental outcomes that, we, that we've talked a lot about today, and I just want to highlight some a little bit. Y'all had a lot of pictures. A lot of y'all's pictures look like my pictures. These are all from, from regions I work in. I don't get on many farms where I don't see this somewhere, uh, somewhere where there's high, high road erosion, um, typically due to you know, the slope or unstable soils or area where we get water pulling up like y'all do. It, we get so much rainfall, this, this picture with the flooding, that this, this happens all the time. And we actually get root rot or sun scorch uh, that reduces yield quite dramatically. I don't know if y'all have to deal with those as well. But that soil's going somewhere. It's probably going somewhere and causing another outcome off farm uh, down, down the water line. And there's some challenges associated with that that we need to address. And there was a great paper published by David Muth uh, in 2014 in the Journal of Soil and Life Conservation where he posed the question like, are profitability and environmental performance, are they really competing? And what he showed is, like a lot of y'all said today, where you've got low organic matter, low, uh, higher slopes, uh, more sand, you tend to have less yield, right? That's, that's typically noticed this region. Oh, is there a pointer on this thing? Oh, no, that's not a pointer. Uh, never mind. Notice that region in the bottom left-hand corner of the field, right? That's, they're losing money. And what you showed is that's also an area where they have the most nitrogen leaking out. So low yielding areas, marginal farming areas are typically causing some environmental challenges that none of us want to you know, see happen. We've got to find ways to address it. Um, and what I'm gonna walk you through is one of the options that I think we have. The fourth assumption, and probably my most fun, is that precision ag technology can identify the overlap in these economic and uh, conservation uh, uh, challenges. It can show us where the economic opportunities are. The economic opportunities often occur where the environmental challenges exist, right? The overlap between those is what's important. And most of my precision ag research in the last several years has been focusing on finding a way to quantify that overlap and, and use it in a way that gives a farmer the way to make an informed economic decision um, to, to try to address that. So there's been a lot of talk about the definition of precision ag. I think the very first speaker Today, uh, they've all had good ones, that one in particular. Last time I dug into it, there were about 14 definitions floating in the literature uh, for precision ag, right? It may be more. We're, you know, academics are really good at making up new definitions so everybody can claim it's theirs, okay? Well, the, one of the first, my first exposure to precision ag was in this publication, It Advances in Agronomy. It was by Pearson Nowak in 1999. And it wasn't really a definition per se in terms of the technical sense. It was just kind of a philosophy, doing the right thing at the right place, at the right time in the right way. And I, I use that one because, really, because it ties really well back to that quote from out of Leopold I started with, so it really helps my argument. But the point is, we've got a lot of technology to be able to do the things that I'm describing now that we didn't necessarily have 30, 30 years ago. So we've seen the economic challenges on the landscape where farmers are losing money. It's often places that are of ecological challenges as well. And that gives us opportunities to address that and opportunities to address the conservation and hopefully find a way to increase revenue uh, from addressing those areas. And precision ag is, is at the overlap. I think there's been like 10 Venn diagrams shown in the last two days and I just thought I'd add one in there too. I don't want to be the only person without a Venn diagram. But precision ag is essentially where all these things meet up. And that's what we want to address. 
So we can take the areas we've seen before. We can use yield monitors, which is my primarily uh, the tool of precision ag that I use amongst the 30 or 40 different tools that Joy mentioned earlier. And then we can take that and identify where the farmer's losing money. And then in the U.S. at least, and I don't know what the extent y'all have conservation uh, payment issues, uh, uh, opportunities here, but oftentimes just not farming an area that's really low yielding and letting it revegetate naturally can, can actually increase revenue of the field because of the, the economic loss. But we can pair that with a conservation opportunity of some kind and, and a, hopefully affect revenue in a positive way. This brings us to the field of precision conservation. So this was a book that was published a few years ago that I was fortunate enough to, to have a chapter in that my, one of my, uh, my advisor and I wrote. And all precision conservation is, is using the same technology to achieve more specific conservation objectives. And the, this term precision conservation was really coined by the water quality uh, uh, researchers who were using it to look at how they can identify how to put vegetative buffers in a way that can reduce runoff in the most effective manner. So this is a really cool definition and it's really not that different than all the definitions of precision ag to the point where I've had arguments with people that do we really need a difference? I think precision ag is precision conservation. Every definition posed today seemed to address increasing profitability and having better environmental outcomes. So using precision ag in a conservation context kind of gives us the, the way to a, approach this. The last assumption before I get into the results is that when you return marginal acres to conservation, you can actually increase farm revenue and benefit the environment. And I say and benefit the environment because revenue is great and that's what I want farmers to make, but there's also, as several speakers have mentioned, the supply chain, a lot of industry people are being pressured to show conservation footprints and, and benefits, and this is one way to do it. You'll notice I didn't say converting to marginal acres. I said returning to marginal acres, right? I hate that word convert. <laughs> returning, a lot of these areas that are really marginal, they were something before they were in production. And sometimes it's just, we can make more money just by returning them to that. Uh, farm the best acres and let, let's do something else with the rest of them. So, like I said, in the U.S., in our farm bill, we have a conservation title where we have about 40 different practices just within the Conservation Reserve program that essentially pay farmers to address some environmental concern. Could be er erosion, wildlife habitat, which is my favorite, pollinators, wetlands, anything you want. There's almost too many options, right? One of the biggest complaints we hear from farmers is it's just it's information overload, right? But we have this ability to address things like uh, implement riparian buffers, filter strips, grass waterways, anything you really want to put on, the government will pay you if you qualify to do that. And I'm going to walk you through some of this um, example. So typical field in the Blackland Prairie, Mississippi, where I do a lot of research, and a farmer hopefully comes to me and says, hey, I've got some yield data. I wish this happened more often, but it doesn't happen quite enough. But they come to me with some yield data and say, hey, is there anything I can do with this field? And my research associate, I now make him do this, so I don't have to anymore. But he gets the yield data, he meets with the farmer, and you know, it comes in a point file, and then we get some production cost information, how much they're putting into the field, what they sold stuff at, you know, what, or what economic commodity price they want to they simulate, and we produce a profit map. Now, when we first started doing this, it was fairly novel. Now, FieldView and everybody, you know, there's a million platforms that can produce profit maps. This is not novel in any, in any way, but how we use that profit map, because I think every speaker has also mentioned, especially uh, the first panel, there's a difference between getting the data, having the ability to collect the data, and using it to have a prescription change in how you manage, right? I get a lot of yield data from farmers that they've never looked at. They watch the computer as they're cutting, and they go, oh, that's interesting. And then when I ask them if they, we can have it, they have to call Nutrien or whoever is holding it with them, and they have to, we, we send somebody to go get it because they've actually never taken it themselves and looked at it. They print off a map and they're kind of done with it. But in this profit map, you see that we've actually got some issues of concern. We've got some red areas often near the field edge on this northern boundary, probably due to some compaction, which several of the speakers have talked about, but most likely from com competition with that, uh, with that tree line right there. That's one of the major issues we see in the prairie. And then we've got this on the southeastern part that's a little bit, uh, a little bit problematic. So what we can do with this software that we've, uh, we've copyrighted, it's called the MSU Precision Conservation Software, and I'm not going to get much into that, but just to demonstrate it, we can essentially match a conservation practice that fits the landowner's objectives and the payments that they'll get from that and then simulate what replacing that on the landscape would be. So if we do a 60-foot conservation buffer, we know what that payment's going to be because the Farm Bill has told us what it's going to be, or a 120-foot conservation buffer simulated uniformly around the field, we can actually simulate what that economic change is going to look like and then the software outputs a comparison. Now, like I said, the red was the original profit per acre, and it was a profitable field, about $70 per acre in profit, which is not uncommon in certain years in the prairie. 
However, by strategically implementing conservation in, in a way that was economically beneficial to address those red acres, we actually went to over $100 per acre, so quite a, quite a jump. Okay? Now, not every farmer is going to do this, and nor do I expect them to. What I wanted them to be able to do is know what the outcome would be if they did it. That way they can make an informed decision. Now, I don't, the other thing we show is we'll show for a given conservation practice, this black line here simulates every cell of that field that is actually more profitable under conservation than farming. Now, no one would ever enroll that because it's a squiggly line, the tractor's going to turn a million times, and we don't want them to. What we want them to be able to do is take that, and they use our software to use that to guide and create their own conservation scenario that fits their management, act, their, their management goals. So maybe they just want to take out that issue on the, on the edge. Maybe they don't want a uniform buffer around the whole field. That's it's their land. They should be able to do that, and the Farm Bill allows that flexibility. And then we simulated this next one under a different commodity price. But you'll notice now we've created a uniform profit map, and that's what you want. You want to reduce that variability to the extent you can to get more uniformity out of that. And I think I did this simulation at a different commodity price, so everybody's making more money here. But in generally, it's still a $20 per acre swing through economically targeting the, the red acres and, and using conservation in that context. So more evidence to this one, I'll walk you through a case study. This was in uh, Lowndes County, Mississippi. Uh, we just published this paper earlier this year in the Journal of Precision Agriculture, where we simulated a couple different things. We looked at, we had about 52 fields, we had about five, six years of yield data on most fields with the exception of a few, and we looked at what would happen if we just simulated profitability just from farming, just as is, then what would happen if we just maxed out conservation? Let's just enroll everything we can and just max it out, which is what a lot of people in the conservation community want farmers to do. I'm not a fan of that. And then we did, let's just do it economically. Let's target it in a way that oh, we only take out acres that we can make more money on through farming. And what we did was, so there's the profit map for just one given field. That first panel is just the profit map. That's just what the farmers, that's what's happening on, a, on a, in a, any given year. The third one is the profit map if we just maximize a buffer, just put a, as wide of a buffer as the program will allow us, and let's just roll with it. Number two there, that black line represents only where conservation is more profitable than farming. Right, the economically targeted approach. And then the fourth panel there is just the profit map depiction of if you did that more strategically, because we don't want to, we try to straighten the lines out and make sure it's nothing, nothing complicated. And, um, and what we found was really interesting. The farm was very profitable, and I apologize for going back from acres to hectares, but it depends on what journal you publish it in, what they want, I can't keep up with it. Uh, but this is a profitable farm, right? The guy's making a lot of money on average. When you maximize conservation though, when you just throw every bit of conservation you can into it, you actually decrease revenue. And that's because not all those acres are bad. Some of those acres are good. They need to be farmed, right? But when you take our targeted approach where you only enroll when it's economically feasible, we actually increased overall farm revenue by 26%. Okay, so 26% increase in profitability simply from uh, strategically implementing a conservation practice on the worst possible marginal acres. Now, across those 37, it was about 71% of the fields that we did th that were conducive to this. The rest of them were fine as is. There was really no prescription we could offer. Of those 37 fields where we increased profitability, it was very drastically from like 1% to 200 plus percent. Now, I would never, never want a farmer to take land out of production for a 2% increase in profitability. I think that's very risky. But the reason I show, I show this, this, this histogram is that, you know, I'd start at the right and work my way back left because every farmer has a unique level with the amount of money they need to make more to make a land use change. And it's different for every farmer. No one has the same one. Well, I want a farmer to be able to see this and go, you know what, here's mine. And then use that information to make an informed economic decision. Just if you take all the fields we had, just a histogram of all the, of all the profitability of all the sales in dark gray versus the targeted approach, what you'll notice is we just shifted the distribution of profitability to the right. There's very few cells right there in those columns there that's left of zero in the negative. We didn't get rid of all of them, there's still some, because some acres we couldn't get to. But it's a shift in the distribution of profitability through, through using conservation to, to economically achieve that. So just to show you an example, because somebody's gonna ask, I hope they ask, I generally get this question, well, what commodity price did you use? Well, we simulated a bunch of them because we wanted to be able to show that it actually changes quite dramatically. So this is uh, $8 a bushel for uh, soybeans, and this is four fields. That black line is the profitable buffer, conservation buffer. Everything under that line is more profitable in conservation, right? The payment from 
the conservation is going to be higher than what the farmer's making on average. But as we move up to nine bushels, 10 bushels, 11 bushels, 12 bushels, a dollars a bushel, I'm sorry, not bushels, um, you'll notice it starts to shrink, right? And that's expected because as the price grows up, some marginal acres become more profitable. And we stopped at 12 when we published this because back then that was as high as beans were, we thought we were going to get. And boy, were we wrong. Uh, the reason I show you this is that there's still some acreage out there that is more profitable in a conservation scenario. And I want the farmer to be able to see that distribution and go, you know what? If, if I, if I don't know if I want to take that risk because, I, or if I do, this area over here is, I'm, I'm, I'm making more money in conservation either way. That's the only area I'm willing to risk because of some years I may do well on those other acres. And that's okay. We want them to be making an informed economic decision to ad address these marginal acres. Now, I said it can increase revenue. What about benefit to the environment? Like I said, I'm a, I'm a, this bird right here, I don't believe y'all have this bird. This is the northern bobwhite. It's very similar to y'all's gray partridge. Uh, spent my entire career studying this bird. It's considered an umbrella species. We call it the canary, canary on the prairie. If you've got quail, you've probably got a lot of other grassland birds that, that are, it, it's an indicator of ecosystem health, okay? So we looked at looking at conservation buffers years ago and what would happen if we, we, do, we did a lot of monitoring with these conservation buffers and looked at how much of the landscape has to change to see an increase in this bird and using it as a surrogate for other birds. And what we found was when there's no conservation in the landscape, no, no conservation specific buffers, for example, there's still some residual populations of birds. So there's no than there that yellow is, I should have a legend here, yellow is agriculture, the green is trees. When you, when you add a little bit, three, little over three and a half percent of the landscape, small change, three and a half percent of the landscape to a conservation, you actually get a 23% increase in abundance of this bird. So a disproportionate change, a small change in landscape that we've already demonstrated can generate more revenue when it's used strategically, is actually benefiting this very sensitive, uh, you know, threatened bird. And it, the more you add, the more it goes up until eventually, you know, you can get 29%, I think, increase by 14% change. But that first one's the big jump. A small, less than 5% change in landscape, huge increase in abundance of this bird. Okay, so that was about a 4% change and we've seen with 23% increase in abundance. That was from my research. A uh, colleague of mine across 14 states showed the same thing. A 5% change in land use from conservation and agriculture had a 52% increase uh, in this species. Like I said, this is just one species we're using as an example, right? So we can map big changes to the environment, to the ag landscape with very little change in land use. That, that's the whole point. And we put this in the context of kind of the land sharing versus the land sparing debate. This is something that's ecologists have been debating for about 30 years now, I think, on do we share the land in terms of conservation with farmers? That means integrate wildlife conservation into the production system, or do we spare land? Do we take land out of production? And my argument is neither one of them is perfect, and neither one of them is better than the other, but what's missing from this argument, in my opinion, has always been what, which one's more economic to the farmer, right? Now, I get in trouble with conservation groups. I don't say it quite that way when I'm at different conferences, but I'm around a bunch of agricultural people here, I think I can say it. This doesn't address the economics, and it should, because the economics, as multiple speakers have said, that's what drives land use decisions. Um, really cool research has come out, and last thing, this was in the proceedings of the Royal Society. Uh, Richard Pilwell's research showed that wildlife-friendly farming, so taking a little land, integrating conservation into, conservation buffers into the production system can actually increase yield. Uh, they, they're showing this in Europe in a couple of studies too, which is very interesting. They think it's primarily due to beneficial insects uh, and some inter interesting things with that. Uh, other research has shown that hedgerows and field margins can actually increase avian farm diversity and create a bunch of different ecosystem services. I, I, this the idea that when you put kind of vegetation, natural vegetation in these landscapes, there's some environmental benefits. And then a really cool study from Sarah Cross a couple years ago showed that by creating habitat for certain avian species like birds, they're actually operating as a pest regulatory service, which means birds are essentially an ecosystem service now. That's amazing. Uh, because they have to feed their chicks something, and a lot of times they're, they're going into the crop fields and actually picking out, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to say bugs around a bunch of entomologists, I know that, but they're picking out invertebrates that uh, are feeding their chicks, and that's, that's somewhat of a service. And that's fascinating to me that we can actually benefit the, the landscape, make it more environmentally resilient, and hopefully do it in a way that's economically beneficial to the producer. Um, another example from colleagues of mine published looking at the same thing, that's kind of boring. Okay, let's get into parting thoughts in my last three minutes. 
Another quote from Otto Leopold, I'm going to read this one because I love it. A thing to be encouraged is the use of private land in such a way as the, to combine the public and the private interest to the greatest possible degree. Private landowners own most of the agricultural landscape. I know in the U.S. I assume it's the same in, throughout most of Canada. They bear the, the burden of producing all these public goods, clean water, clean air, ecosystem services, carbon sequestration, right? That's a huge responsibility. We've got to find ways to make that less of a burden to the farmer, right? They, the public interest is, is obvious. The, the farmer's interest, I think, has been somewhat neglected over time, and I'd like to see that change. The last one is conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves that public interest. Like I said, this, this guy was writing this stuff in the, in the early 30s, and I said he was, he was way ahead of his time, at least in U.S. agricultural policy. So finding ways to make conservation activities be economically beneficial to the producer, I think, is, is, is an endeavor worth, worth working on. Um, this is a paper I published uh, a couple years ago, I think, and what we suggested was that ROI, which has been said on almost every talk, had been completely neglected from the conservation agricultural conver landscape conversation. Wildlife biologists have never considered ROI, right? We just said, hey, do it for butterflies, do it for birds. Now we're saying do it for carbon. Those are great endeavors, but the return on investment has to be there. I think the first speaker said something about it's got to make economic sense, and I, somebody else said it later. Um, and I, I agree more and more and more. So if we target those traditionally low producing areas, those hot spots, those flood prone areas, maybe it's a saline issue, and we can increase, do it in an economically way, find the acres that are most uh, challenging, we can increase whole field profitability, we can provide a lot of ecosystem services, and you know, I'm a little biased, I'm, I want more wildlife habitat, obviously. Um, and then precision ag is what I consider one of the best tools in, in, in our arsenal to be able to do that, yield maps especially, and with that we can kind of overlap, find that overlap between conservation and profitability and help farmers visualize where they can create these different, uh, these different non-crop areas on their field in a way that is hopefully beneficial to their production system. Um, so I've got it here, but I think somebody said this exact same thing earlier. If it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense. Okay, and that is a, a, a phrase that we don't hear enough in the conservation community working in ag landscapes. Um, it's got to be compatible for a farmer to be able to do it. They've got enough things to worry about. Um, finding a way to diversify kind of your investment portfolio of your field and taking risky elements like risky soils and making them less risky through conservation, I think, is an is a interesting approach. Uh, and we do that, we can hopefully meet the environmental objectives of landscape that society is, has, has put on the shoulders of, of, of farmers, but also do it in a way that is economically uh, beneficial. There's last thing, I think I've got 26 seconds left. I, I, I've heard the first talk in the opening, innovation and collaboration, right? And so I loved, I loved hearing that because I already had the slide in there, I promise I didn't add it after I heard that. But I like the idea of collaborating to innovate. And what's interesting between the agricultural sector, wildlife conservation, ecologists, uh, sustainable ag, environmentalists, the, the soil industry, the water industry, everybody, it's the gravel roads in between these crop fields that connect all our interest. And I stole that quote from my friend uh, Ryan Henniger. But we all have a, a benefit, we all benefit from enhancing this landscape. I suggest we find new and innovative ways to do it in a way that's profitable to the farmer that makes the decision much more easier for them to accomplish. And I believe I am done. Thank you for your time. Don't go, don't go too far away. I'd just like to ask the speakers to, uh, to join me up here on stage and, and grab a seat at the, uh, on, on one of the benches here. And, uh, and then we can have the um, questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, and then I know that uh, Warren is uh, uh, checking some of the uh, questions that have come in on the, uh, on the chat. So if there's any questions from the audience, I'll just do a scan first. I got one hand up at the back. Uh, there, if, Courtney, if you want to just grab the mic uh, over to uh, to the center of the room. Thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, I had a question about uh, tile drainage and targeted tile drainage um, for for dealing with you know, potholes and temporary water, not, not so much on the grid. And I didn't see much information on that. I'm just kind of curious. I think that's where uh, I should introduce myself. Rob Stoller, or Carver, and Davidson, and. Uh, that's where I'm really interested in managing some of those areas uh, to our benefit for, for a number of reasons, more for field efficiency, but also for nutrient management 
and uh, dealing with those small nuisance areas. Have you got much research on the, on the benefits of looking at those uh, type of systems in our sort of pothole area? Yeah, uh, great question. That's actually, unfortunately, one of the slides I took out of the, the presentation, um, just due to interest of time. But uh, yeah, a lot of the, um, you know, the drainage work, the literature, the body of knowledge is, is uh, draining uh, flatter landscapes in, in uh, warmer climates. So certainly getting into, as, as tile is kind of marching across the uh, variable landscapes in, in our, our prairies here, I think uh, more attention has to be paid to, to um, understanding the best uh, layouts, targeted layouts uh, for our fields. Um, related to that, I mentioned uh, briefly there a research demonstration project we're working on in, in southwest Manitoba, and that's, that's really around just that. It's, you know, kind of to simplify the uh, discussion, how far up the slope, you know, do we have to drain um, for effective drainage and connecting that to uh, profitability return on investment. And, um, you know, our, our uh, Soil landscapes in in this region they're they're kind of like snowflakes. That's an analogy I, I like to use. They're they're very unique. So, you know, it's, it's certainly not going to be a one size fits all all solution that we can come up with. But, um, you know, the more knowledge we can we can gain in that area, it's you know it's going to pay back for sure. And, um, you know, that's something that I think we have to work on together in terms of, of academia, um, you know, consulting world and, and contractors and producers to best uh, figure out. Uh, effective drainage in these landscapes. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll take a question from the um, uh, online uh, there, uh, Warren. Yeah, sure, so the, uh, the top rated question right now it just has to do with uh, returning field edges to uh, a conservation area and would that over time simply just displace that, uh, that edge effect and, and it result in now you've got a new area that would require a conservation area? Great, yeah, great question. Um, I get that question all the time, and I used to have this really scripted answer, but then more research gets coming out, so I have to keep changing it. Uh, it would seem intuitive that, yeah, you're just displacing that, that, that field, that, especially field edge issue, you're just displacing that, that issue. It, it depends. Uh, there's been three papers published in the peer-reviewed literature that have, have, have asked that specific question directly, and what they found was they over, I think they looked at three years of yield data post-establishment, they did not see that. Uh, the one paper that showed did show a little bit of, of an extension or a displacement of that was when you replaced that region with another tree community, right? And once the trees got up. So I work in prairie systems a lot. I don't like trees. Uh, and I, I study a bird that really doesn't care for trees either. Uh, so I try to promote uh, herbaceous plant communities as, 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 as a function with that. There was a paper published, um, Stamps et al., 2008, I think. And what they showed was in the herbaceous plant communities, you didn't see any real displacement of it. In fact, you're, you're and it's probably to do with years of compaction as well uh, on those on those edges. So the other thing is, on, and most of the situations that I showed examples of, those are plant communities that are managed, and by managed I mean they are disturbed frequently to keep them in that plant community. So we use prescribed fire, for example, as our primary management tool in the prairie. So it's burned every couple of years, so they kind of stay like that. And in those cases, no, we don't. Uh, but if you plant trees there, yes, over time those, those trees get up, they are going to drastically compete for, for nutrients, sunlight, and those kinds of things. So my take is just don't plant trees. <laughs> Great question. And I think we got a, a Chuck's got the, the mic. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Fossey, Manitoba Canola Growers. Uh, my question is also about tile drainage. And just kind of curious, like I farm in the Red River Valley just outside of Winnipeg, where the land is very flat. And sometimes in the summer, we'll get these here very heavy rains and all the you know, municipal and provincial drains fill up to capacity and the water stands there for a long time. Now, if you have a field that's tile drain, do you have a problem with water kind of backing up into the field through the tiles and saturating the soils even though the surface might be uh, dry? Uh, yeah, that can that can certainly happen. Um, you know, I mentioned in my talk the the drainage effective drainage outlet is is the number one consideration for an effective drainage system, and um, you know that's a per perfect example where you know even if you have a good drainage outlet right at the field regionally, sometimes that system can't accept that water, and and in extreme cases you can actually get a backup of of water. Uh, I mentioned this research and, and demonstration site we have at uh, Hardy, Hardy Manitoba, and and this spring we had. Um, just the kind of the perfect storm of, of conditions to, to wreak havoc on us. We had a really early 
uh, spring melt. So getting into these cold climates, uh, we can have a, uh, these other issues. We had a really early spring melt when the ditches were still full of, of snow and ice. Culvert was was frozen. So you know we had uh, a backup of, of water uh, during that rapid spring, early spring melt event, and and we had some backup in the tile and then and. T- because in our research site we have these uh, above ground monitoring structures that that actually froze that that water in our control structures which which didn't allow uh, early drainage when when uh, you know the rest of the system thawed out because we we got into an extended cold period after that initial melt so um, yeah effective uh, local and regional outlet is is critical and um, um, you know consideration of keeping uh, keeping ditches and, and culverts clear for uh, uh, for dr- early spring drainage Important. Warren, we'll take another question from the from the online. Sure. So an online question here for for Marla with regards to re, uh, replacing topsoil on those eroded eroded knolls. Is there uh, any consideration in terms of soil types or, or risks? And and the example here was uh, for uh, herbicide residue, for instance, to be transferred back to those. Uh, those hilltops, or, or what? What are some of the risks that maybe more broadly that could be associated with replacing that topsoil? Well, I, I think it really is going to depend. There is going to be some potential based on soil texture because, but sometimes the the benefits that you're seeing based on the soil texture is going to be higher, right? So if you've got those sandier soils, you have that much bigger benefit from putting that topsoil back on compared to some of the clays that might be able to withstand some of that. Um, the question around some of the variability, though, and things like herbicide uh, degradation or effectiveness, that type of thing, as well as the other thing that we don't necessarily talk about or think about so much on eroded knolls, especially where we have high pH in our, um, in our subsoil, is that we also have higher impacts of things like ammonia toxicity and such with seed placement of fertilizer and so we can actually see way harsher seed burn and such happening on those eroded knolls so again keeping those soil factors in mind can actually show rather than maybe a a negative side effect of you know moving that soil back to the top it's actually a bigger benefit from doing that in terms of general management of fertilizers seed and such perfect thanks and i think we've got a question over uh, over on this side Yes, uh, my, my question's to Mark. Uh, Mark, um, I, well, I'm Steve Shirley from the University of Saskatchewan. I'm involved in a project that's eerily similar to what you guys are doing down there where we're, we're, <laughs> where we're, where we're mapping within scale, uh, within field spatial variability uh, and, and prairie, uh, on, on prairie land and trying to find what I call even sub-marginal areas, like areas that are probably never Never uh, profitable. But anyway, so I, I don't want to ask about that. What I want to ask you about is, and you're, what, we have an economist working on this as well, and one of the, one of the uh, things he's trying to do is to map, is to, is to uh, figure out the economics of the intangible returns. Like, like what is the value of aesthetics uh, for that farmer of having a perfectly square field? Or what is about, what about that kind of that risk behavior of knowing that that one area, maybe one year in 10, does actually return very good profit? And I wonder how you've, how you've dealt with that. Because these are all, you know, kind of personal characteristics that, that influence people's decisions. Oh man, that's a great question. So one of the things that, as precision agricultural research has advanced, one of the things I think that is missing uh, is the social science side of it, right? So I make all those assumptions to, to, on the research I do. The assumption that you're missing that I didn't mention, and, and now I have to bring up, but uh, is that I'm assuming that, when, that asymmetric information is what limits a farmer from making a certain decision, right? Because everything I'm saying is trying to give the farmer the ability to make an informed decision. Well, that, that's assuming that if they have that information, they're going to make what I would consider the most plausible economic decision. Well, that there's tons of economic research on you know, inf- value of information theory that shows that that's not always the case, right? So what we don't understand to a great degree is, like I said, what it is that keeps farmers from doing it. Like y'all talked about adoption rates earlier. Uh, in the U.S., in the Midwest, we've got fairly good adoption rate in terms of acreage, but it's not necessarily widely adopted by farmers. And th- in terms of yield monitors, for example, like the question is why not? To your point, yeah, what, what is it about the individual, uh, the individual farmer and how they think that determines whether or not that matters to them, right? What is the value of a square field? What is the value of this? We have no idea 
because at least not in the U.S. because we have not. Uh, I, I've worked with, I've written two proposals to propose some of these questions and working with ag economists to do ecosystem valuation and uh, human dimensions uh, researchers who, who do social science questions. And I've had a really hard time getting them funded because it's, it doesn't seem to the, uh, and the, most of these grants have been federal uh, grants I've applied to, the, the, re the resounding comment that comes back when they reject my proposal is that, which is, you know, a wonderful day, and <laughs> is they don't believe precision ag is adopted enough to even be asking the question. And my counter has always been, well, if I knew more about the mental process of this, this technology and what, what these things like you're describing mean, if I could study it, maybe I could figure out a way to do something different so it would be wildly, more widely adopted. So it's somewhat of a, of a circular argument. But if you have information on that, I would love to hear it because we have a really hard time. Uh, we have a lot of research on farmers' decision making, uh, how they make decisions, but rarely do we ask those intangibles. And, and I think that's a huge area of research that, that, that if, if I was smarter, I would figure out how to answer. But I don't have a good answer other than you are 100% right and I hope somebody finds the answer quick and sends it to me. Uh. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't have the answer. I'm working with an economist that thinks he has an idea, a way to look at it. But anyways, we can talk later. I'd love to hear more about that. That's awesome. Thanks so much. I see, see one, one hand, so that'll be our last, uh, last question. Um, so this question is for Marla, and hopefully I don't get blacklisted at our tractor factory for asking this. But... Uh, um, you know, you showed some slides on compaction, um, and obviously it's a, it's a huge issue within agriculture. And I, I'd just like to know if you had a message for the OEMs and, and to growers, you know, how do we, what, what's your recommendation for, uh, for mitigating compaction, and, you know, how should we think about building our equipment to, to mitigate that? See, this is the reason why I don't like getting asked to give the compaction talk, um, because I, I, you know, I get thrown tomatoes, whatever, like people are going to start throwing things at me if I'm not careful. Um, the only way that you can stop compaction from happening is to stay off the field um, and to do, or at least stay off the field <laughs> when it, the soil is at the inappropriate moisture content, which is always when we're trying to get on, on the field. And I think quite often we, we, we don't always fully understand or recognize that when we see those big ruts, like when it's really, really wet and saturated, we're not causing a lot of compaction then. Uh, we're causing compaction when soil's near field capacity, so when it is moist, that is the problem. The other issue is that as equipment gets bigger, it gets heavier, and it's the weight of the equipment that is driving compaction deeper in the soil. We can debate all day on t tracks and tires and that kind of discussion. Um, ultimately, that is affecting the topsoil. Um, it is the axle load of the equipment, and the bigger those uh, grain carts get, the heavier they get, and that axle load drives that compaction deeper, and once it's there, especially deep compaction, we're not fixing that. And we say we're going to rely on Mother Nature to, like, freeze-thaw is going to do it. Freeze-thaw is, we're talking surface. Um, freeze-thaw isn't, isn't going deep. So if we're dealing with those types of issues, we have to wait for wetting and drying, especially on soils that have cracking, like shrink swell clays, to actually crack open those soils. Um, and then we can get into a whole talk on subsoiling and whether or not that's going to be beneficial. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert it's not. Um, and so, yeah, there's so much to talk about with compaction, but the biggest thing is that we're on the field at the wrong time, typically. And so we do need to think a bit more strategically on how we're going to manage. Number one thing, if you've got nothing else you can do when it comes to the compaction, especially when we're dealing with, say, wetter falls, because that's when a lot of that heavy equipment is going across the field, is have a conversation as a grower with your grain cart operator or whoever is traveling across the field and travel on the same track over and over and over again. 80% um, of compaction comes with the first pass. And so you want to make sure that you're traveling on that same track. So if your grain cart is coming up, go on the past, 